today I'm joined by Chirit De Witt. Uh, Chirit is a friend of mine I've met in Bolsart. We used to work in the same kitchen. Uh, he's now living in Jamaica. I um, don't know exactly where you are, but you can add that later. Uh, the further introduction is that he is um, doing things with, uh, he has your own company and um, what was it, uh, the, the design, um, designing the... Yeah, social media advertising design. Yeah, yeah, a lot of different things. And you did a study in architecture. And that's what we are going to talk about today, about uh, one of the essays that you did. And what else you know about architecture and I, I, yeah, we can uh, have a, hopefully a great conversation about that. And I'd also like to thank you for uh, doing this podcast and uh, taking the time. Taking the time. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for having me on, Jasper. Uh, it's, uh, it's really nice to uh, talk again and uh, do this type of video call. I'm, uh, I'm currently in Jamaica, like you said, and I'm lo uh, located in Treasure Beach. So I'm talking to you from one of the most beautiful places on earth, in uh, my opinion. Mm. And uh, yes, I, um, I, I've come here uh, a few months ago, been here many times before in the past, but currently doing some remote work. I started an online business in social media advertising, I do graphic design for people and I help them get like customers for their products online and advertise uh, their stores, whatever uh, they need. Now, at the same time, I'm also uh, studying architecture. And so I started this year, a few years ago now, I'm in my third year of architecture school. And for one of my classes, I did a deep dive. I did a lot of research into um, the history of the Minoans. And it's a civilization from Crete in Greece uh, that I was fortunate enough to visit with my father when I was about 12 years old, maybe, maybe 14, 15. I mm. went to this site on Crete, which is uh, the ruins of what is supposedly the, 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 the labyrinth of the Minotaurus. Right? So uh, I was uh, fascinated by this place. And when I got the opportunity in architecture school to study a historic site, I knew very, uh, very quickly what I wanted to research and what I wanted to write about. So, uh, yeah, that's uh, that's did, did, you, was... did you say minotaurs? Yes, yes. But, so that every... uh, labyrinth or? Absolutely. So everybody that's ever played any type of uh, video game uh, might have probably already seen uh, an image of a minotaur. And it's a, it's a, a half human with a, or a human with a bull head. And it's an interesting mythological character uh, from the ancient Greeks. And it is actually accredited to this particular location. Hmm. So supposedly the Minotaur is the product of Zeus coming down to earth in the form of a bull and um, kind of romanticizing or um, yeah how do i put this he gets the wife of king minos of crete to fall in love with him and so supposedly the king's wife creates this child with a bull and because the child is a demigod they can't just cast it away this, uh, this minotaur actually gets housed into a labyrinth. And so the ancient Greeks that stumbled upon the ruins of this Minoan society, they must, have been, uh, they must have been in awe of what they discovered because it's a very advanced civilization. Their architecture shows signs of a high culture. And the palace was so large and the corridors were so plentiful that it seemed like a labyrinth and so the bards of the ancient Greeks must have uh, had a very easy time letting their imagination run wild and come up with the story of King Minos. And supposedly this Minotaur was locked in his labyrinth and needed to be appeased uh, by annual human sacrifice. To, uh, I guess, hmm. uh, feed this blood, uh, animal's bloodlust. Now, eventually the, the Minotaur is killed when Theseus uh, 
volunteers to be a tribute and actually slays the, the, the bull with the help of the daughter of the king that lives there. It's a, it's a fantastic story, mm. but likely that's all it is. The, mm. the, the, the ruins at Knossos, they're, they're really, really special uh, because what they show is, is, this, is this ancient civilization that we know very little about. They have this writing called Linear A. It's a precursor to Linear B and then Greek uh, later onwards, but we've never been able to decode this language. So all we know about them is the architecture that they left and some of the remains that we found inside of the uh, archaeological digs. Hmm. And it's very limited. And most of what we know can be attributed to this archaeologist called Arthur Evans. Uh, Arthur Evans, he uh, was this, uh, this boy, imagine growing up in London and your parents are archaeologists and you're always surrounded by antiquarians and all of these relics of uh, far away. And so he always grew up with uh, an interest in prehistory. And this guy, he went to Crete. He visited it for the first time in 1894. And um, eventually he visited the site of Knossos with its, uh, its original discoverer. It's a guy called, um, he was called Minos Kalo, Kalo Kairinos. <laughs> and uh, they, they, they together explored this ruin site and the man was fascinated. So three years later, he bought all of the land surrounding it and uh, he spent the rest of his life doing archeological digs over there and expanding uh, what we know about these people. Weren't uh, they the sa same civilization as in like Troy with the uh, war, Trojan War? So it's very, it's very interesting uh, to think about how they might be connected, but uh, the time of Troy and the Trojan Wars was actually uh, centuries later because ah, these were three Greeks. They existed oh, okay. before the Greeks were formed and the Minoans were likely uh, descendants from Egyptians. Uh, so uh, so what, what time are we talking about? So the palace was constructed around 1900 BC, uh, uh, but it was built on a mound. And so it's very likely that if you would dig down in that mound, you would find set settlements going back from millennia. Uh, but what we know is that the construction methods were inherited from Mesopotamia and Egypt. And it's likely that the Minoans actually came up from Egypt and they were a seafaring civilization. So they had a very strong navy. They were very uh, successful traders. And it seemed like they were so successful that they had no enemies. There's no defensive architecture on Crete. It's actually all just uh, like palace, like everything is completely undefended by walls or towers, anything like that. So they must have completely depended on a navy for protection. Now, uh, coming up from, uh, from Egypt, uh, like the, the, the construction methods that they had were post and lintel systems, you know? you know? So you have a column and then a lintel on top of it. And wow. that technique was uh, used over there as well. But what's interesting about it is that they had to use the materials that were available locally. And so mm -hmm. Crete is very rocky. They had to use rubble, but it's basically like all these weird shaped rocks and wood to build their homes. And so the way they did that, was pretty smart. They would build two walls going up and they filled the middle in with rubble. Mm -hmm. And inside of the structures of their homes, they would have a frame of wood. And they would use these very solid wooden beams uh, in this post and lintel system because the area of Crete is also susceptible to earthquakes. And building this way with a wooden frame and then a stone encasing, you actually create a very, very strong structure that can withstand minor earthquakes. Minor earthquakes? Mm hmm. Yep. You see, the, the, the Minoans, they, they disappeared out of nowhere. It seems like they suddenly vanished, which adds to the mystery and makes it more interesting is the fact that we don't know anything about them. So there's been a few theories about why they might have suddenly disappeared. 
and uh, one of the strongest ones is yeah. uh, is that they might have uh, they might have perished after a volcanic eruption. I, I've heard something about the sea people, and to keep thinking about it, is that like the same time period, or uh, that's about 1177, I think. Yeah, see. yeah, it's very, uh, it's it's in a similar time frame. So, supposedly, if this palace at Knossos was the residence of King Minos, it would have served as the center of power for Crete from about 1650 BC to 1350 BC, but it could of course have existed much earlier. It however seems to have really ended there with the collapse or abandonment of civilization on Crete after that time. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the sea people were definitely, uh, were definitely sharing the same centuries and yeah. the same Mediterranean Sea. And oh, right. Minoans were very powerful sailors. They, they had ships uh, that, that, was, that were able to trade all the way from the mouth of the Mediterranean to Syria. Hmm. Hmm. And there, uh, what, what evidence is there to support this? Uh... So, so there's, um, there's pottery and, uh, that, that has been found uh, in, the, in some of the ruins that were covered in volcanic ash at Santorini that show that there was a strong exchange going on. And then there is also these beautifully uh, vibrant frescoes that were found on the interior walls of the Palace of Knossos that depict the naval scenes, uh, depict the boats and the fishermen. Apparently, it seems like the, me uh, the men in society played a large role in, in fishing and uh, sailing, whilst the, the women uh, would remain on land and actually would fulfill some of the most important responsibilities in society. Mm. had an equal playing field to men. And mm. that's very interesting. Yeah, because yeah. It seems like uh, there's evidence for a matriarchal society that was actually run by the females instead of the men. Mm. Mm. Yeah, you once recommended a book uh, called The Oral Linda, and that I've mentioned it in previous episodes, uh, that they had these matriarchy as well. Yes. And another, another symbol, like what you told about with uh, Labyrinth, it's also seen in, in not necessarily Urlina, but in a lot of different civilizations. So maybe they left their mark or the, the, the symbol is older than they and also have a pretty, pretty interesting experience with labyrinths. So, so like there's a place in Russia, I don't know if you heard about it, also with uh, a, a labyrinth type of uh, architecture. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's, it, that would be very interesting for me to, to, to read more about these. The, what, what kind of gave rise to the idea of a labyrinth has to do with the fact that the construction of the palace at Knossos was based around the central courtyard. So you had this big rectangular square uh, and around it were all of these workshops and storerooms and also ceremonial spaces. But when you look at a plan of the palace, what you see is that these corridors that connect all the rooms, of which there were like 1,400, there were about 1,400 rooms in the palace. They, uh, they are connected in such a 1,400 rooms. 1400. So a total, yeah, it's a lot. So it's a, the whole palace takes up about 22,000 square uh, meters. Hmm. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a vast complex. And it seems to have all been built around the central courtyard that uh, housed uh, the, the, these important sacred buildings, uh, a royal palace with quarters for a king and a queen. Now, this is where we are really seeing the signs of how advanced this culture was, because the royal, the royal chambers in the palace, they actually have a completely functional sewage system. So just imagine this is, this is a long time before we even started counting years. And supposedly nothing like this has been around, but the king was able to flush his toilet back then. And it seems like they were using uh, the, the slope of the mound that it was built on to help them with the drainage and get rid of all the wastewater. All right. So yeah, you sent me some, uh... A PDF of uh, of the essay that you wrote. Uh, yes. Is is the sewage in there as well? Yes, it actually shows you a um, 
an interesting I... section through the building if you want to pull it up. Yeah, that'd be helpful. Yeah. yeah, I think so. Sir. These um, the, these people, the Manons, they they were very advanced artisans and craftspeople, and so they were able to uh, create terracotta piping. And it's actually shown in one of these graphs uh, that I sent you. If you were to go down a few pages. Uh, a few pages, okay. It's right there, just up a little bit. So you'll find that above this section, if you scroll up just a little bit, uh, there is a, an image showing how the piping fitted into each other. You see that right there underneath the columns? The drainage system for the royal apartments, where yeah. they took, it, it took advantage of the slope that the palace was built on and was able to kind of get rid of all the water that came through there. Now, mm -hmm. when you build a palace this big, it is a challenge to make sure that light gets into all of the spaces. And so this was a, a, another solution or another problem that the, the architects of the palace needed to solve. But the solution ended up being the creation of these light wells. And if you scroll up a little bit, there's actually a, a drawing I made that points these out as well. Uh, where? Uh, it's, uh, it's one of my sketches. I think it might be the second page. Yes. Right oh, this, yeah. So light wells um, are basically an opening in the roof that goes down all the way to the ground floor. And usually around these light wells, you'd find a grand staircase that would go up. But light would come in as long with rainwater. And so at the bottom of these light wells, it was usually paved with a drainage system as well to help that water uh, be moved away from uh, from the palace. Now, hmm. it's, it's it's interesting because a lot of times Minoans are credited with the, the, being the cradle of European civilization, uh, but at the same time, you, you would find people in the Indus Valley and people in Mesopotamia they were making the same shift from. Uh, being people that lived off of the land, the people that started to live in these urban clusters. And so what we see with the uh, palace at uh, Knossos is that surrounding it are lots of other buildings. And apparently there is evidence of homes being built right up against the palace walls on the outside. So kind of speaks to a very lax or relaxed relationship between the monarchy and its citizens. And when you look at the way that these buildings were constructed, the architects didn't really seem to care for symmetry. And everything was added haphazardly. You have all these rectangular rooms that are added as the need arises. Yeah. And so it grows in a way where if you look at a plan, uh, which you find like a, a top-down view, and if you scroll down, you, you, you see that it almost looks like some type of cellular structure instead of a real uh, archaeology or, or a real symmetrical build. Hmm. There's a few exceptions, however. You have the North Pillar Hall, uh, and uh, you also have some of the other ceremonial spaces that are completely symmetrical in their design. Hmm. Number, and number seven. Sorry, and, and can there be... Uh, that this was added on uh, multiple generations, like they didn't build, build it in one time, but they built it's it. It's definitely like... likely that this was built over the course of uh, at least a few generations. Yeah, that's, however, that's something you uh, can. Oh, sorry. Yeah, however, like as these buildings radiate outwards, of course, the closer the construction is to the central courtyard, the, the older it would be. Mm. However, there is a lot of evidence for a natural disaster or like an earthquake destroying a, an earlier iteration of this palace and it quickly being completely rebuilt afterwards. Ah, and what was this earthquake? Do they know? Uh, it would have been somewhere within that time frame of 1650 to 1350 BC. Oh, yeah, and that's the, the, the earthquake you mentioned before. Yes, yeah, so um, 
south to Crete, or no, actually north to Crete, you have this island called Santorini. And Santorini uh, used to, it's kind of a ridge that is a remnant of this old volcano called Thera. And Thera uh, erupted somewhere in that time frame uh, and, and seems to have either caused like a massive tidal wave that could have uh, ruined these people. It could have caused uh, the sun to be blocked out for, for a long time. But what we know is that the blast created a sound so loud that it was even recorded in Norway. Hmm. In, in where? In Norway. In Although Norway. In Scandinavia, there are accounts, historical accounts, of uh, people hearing the blast of this volcano erupting all the way in the Mediterranean Sea. How uh, kind of sound uh, or it, is the earthquake so big that they reached all the way up there or is it more the sound that uh, traveled that far? It's the sound, it's the sound. So another extreme example of this would be the Mount Krakatoa, I think in Java, Indonesia, that erupted somewhere in like the 1900s. And its eruption was so loud that the sound was measured to actually go around the earth like two and a half times. Oh, that's a, that's a crazy uh, earthquake. Crazy, and, uh, crazy indeed. Yeah. So yeah, it, it, it could be that that's uh, the reason why the Minoans disappeared all of a sudden, uh, leaving us with these ancient ruins, but no writings to explain them. Hmm. And uh, it's, it's, it's definitely, it's definitely um, puts the imagination at work. I, I know that some of the few things that I do know about the Minoan civilization is that they use some uh, paintings of uh, dolphins yes. and also a bull, uh, which I think uh, reconnects to the bull uh, time age that they were in. Um, so they were connecting with astronomy, like a lot of uh, ancient civilizations did. Um, but I, I would agree look, with that. Yeah. I would agree with that completely. So the. Um, the frescoes that we find on the interior walls of the palace, they depict all types of animals. So you're right, they depict uh, dolphins. They depict bull leaping, which is yep. also a very, uh, like it seems to have been some kind of athletic thing that they were doing. But you can see they also were depicting uh, uh, griffins and other mythological animals. Now, the bull is definitely connected to uh, spirituality and uh, there's a lot of evidence that it also correlates to astronomy and so you're right these people were living in the last age or, or the, the ending of the age of bull or the, the, the taurian age and during this age there were uh, several cults that were formed in egypt in the middle east and surrounding bull worship and this also came with the settlers of Crete. They seemed to have worshipped the bull, which they uh, felt represented the sun. And it seems like these horns of consecration were built uh, on, along the rims of their flat roofs. And it, it, it might have signified their sacred buildings. Mm. Now, there was a lot of bull sacrifice going on. There was a lot of veneration of the bull. And what this, yeah, what this seems to relate to is the fact that in this time period, people were actually uh, worshiping the bull. And after this time period, we move into the age of Aries, which is signified by the ram. And uh, the ending of the age of the bull supposedly is symbolized by Moses coming down the mountain with the, the tablets, the Ten Commandments supposedly also in like the year 1350 BC. And he comes down and he finds people worshiping the golden calf of the bull. And he actually slays the bull. He ends bull worship. And so Moses also represents the age of Aries in that he signals the transition from the age of Taurus to the age of Aries. Mm. Now, yeah, and the, the Jewish the of, sure. Yes, yeah, so the fall of the, the, the Taurus age seems to coincide with the fall of the Minoans. Hmm. Yeah, what I was to say, uh, Moses uses the ram horn, or at least Jews do, 
and they are like fo followers of Moses. Uh, mm -hmm. So that there's that connection there. And it's also reminded me of uh, the Fibonacci spiral um, because of the structure of the RAM itself. Uh, and I can see some spiral work here. Uh, oh, yes. But uh, did they uh, depict, depict the RAM horn or it, did they collapse? Uh, it, seems like, uh, it seems like that was something that arose after the Minoans. So the Minoans, uh, they were really a product of this age of towers and the bull worship that was probably transported with them from Egypt and uh, the, the, the veneration of ram heads and turning the polytheism into one god through the through the goat head is kind of something that happened after the Minoans uh, disappeared. Hmm. And and do they? Uh, because I'm very interested in like the symbology. Uh, what what type of symbology? You can see some things here. Uh, yes. But but is there like any uh, way in which we can? Uh, we know that the the bull represents the sun. But what about the dolphin? It seems to be the, what I know is that it's um, the friend of, of the humans, like a uh, dolphin is very yes, parallel well, to humans. So. The, dolphins, uh, the dolphins also really um, tell us about the connection that the Minoans had with the sea. So taking a boat ride in the Mediterranean, uh, you, you, will actually, uh, you will actually find that dolphins might gather around your boat and start uh, swimming in front of it and jumping up, leaping around you. It's a really nice experience. And so it's likely that they uh, painted what they saw, similar to, the, similar to the bull leaping. But then this interesting fresco depicting a griffin is actually found in the throne room. So it'd be interesting to find a mythical creature in some of the more important spaces. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you, mean you see in the, oh yeah, go ahead. Uh, no, you mentioned the uh, ceremonial places. They probably do they have some symbology in those rooms as well? Or absolutely, yeah. So um, if you look at these frescoes, there is a lot of depictions of these female priestesses. And like I said before, it's clear that women played a very important role in the Noan society. They uh, they were definitely equal to men, if not superior and the roles that they played in society. And this class of priestesses was a remnant of the ancient, uh, the ancient habit of worshiping the feminine. And so when you look at uh, the religions and, and, and the gods that were important, you would find that the female deities played a much larger role than the male deities did. Uh, and if you were to scroll down, there's actually depictions, little statuettes of these female uh, priestesses. If you could scroll down a little bit, we can, uh, we can maybe view those as well. You'll find them depicted holding two snakes in a lot of cases, and they have their breasts bare, which makes, a, which makes, a, makes for an, an interesting kind of look. But it seems that this was a very common way for the Minoan women to uh, go about in their daily lives. Hmm. Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah, I've seen the uh, the, the holding of hands uh, in their both hands holding the snake. I've seen that yes. in, in other cultures as well. I think exactly. I think there's an example of it in, in these images down here as well. Uh, this, I mean, like the, uh, uh, if you see, no, if you scroll down, there should be more imagery uh, uh, that that also depicts these. Oh yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly. And so above it, you see the depiction of men, and men are always shown to be very red-skinned, which could, hmm. mean, could mean could mean multiple things. It could mean that they spend a lot of time in the sun and are very tanned. They do always show up in some type of role where they're laboring and uh, the Minoan prince uh, for example is a very rare sight he, uh, he, he seems to be just as naked as his, uh, as his brothers in the workforce but they don't seem to play a very important role next to the women hmm. uh, so what, what about so they only had priestesses or they also have priesters um, 
Is, it is, seems is, like it seems like men were not part of the religious class in Minoan society, uh, or at least I have not seen any, uh, any, all right. any, any evidence of that. There's, uh, uh, however, a a, um, a large group of artisans in that society. There were very, very uh, talented craftspeople because the more and more people started living in an urban environment surrounding the main palaces, the important buildings, less and less people were actually farming. And so in, in exchange for protection, the, the farmers, they would bring all of their wares to the palace where the food would be kept in the storage rooms. The navy of the king would protect the farmers so they could would live in safety. And in return, they would pay the, farm, uh, the, the king in food and stores, which then in turn could be used to feed the people that were living around the palace that were operating the workshops. So you'd have, like if you think about these frescoes, to achieve this level of, uh, this level of skill, there must be a lot of training. If you look at some of the pottery that they've left us, they, they were very skilled potters, bakers. If they were able to create irrigation systems like, uh, like we already looked at, they must have had some very skilled and highly specialized laborers. And so this is a very high culture that seems to have just disappeared. Mm, mm, that's very interesting. And, and did you use uh, sacred geometry as well in their, in their architecture? So it's, it's interesting. I looked, for, I looked for that and I couldn't, I couldn't really find it in the architecture that remains, though it is important to note that very little remains. So a lot of it is, um, is interpretations, modern interpretations. And so what you'll find uh, in the decorations are these spiral patterns, these rosettes, and the iconography of the horns. Hmm. Uh, the spiral is definitely something that was important to them. So it could have related to some of this other spiral art that we're seeing all around the world. Mm, however, the... Um, the, however, in a lot of cases, that knowledge was kept from ordinary people and usually belonged to the religious class. So it might have been that that knowledge was present, but that it was only available, for example, to these priestesses in the religious class. Mm, mm. All right, and, and uh, to switch it back a little bit to, to architecture itself. Uh, yes. Uh, what what are, are some other civilizations that they interacted with or inspired? Um, like I know of uh, the Egyptian um, yeah, so uh, there's, this, there's this other civilization that sprung up around the same time in the Indus Valley. Uh, so that would be modern day Pakistan, India. Um, there's this culture called the Harappan, uh, Harappan Empire. And this is around the same time period, maybe like maybe a little earlier even. And these people were making the same shift from being agriculturalists exclusively to living in more urban environments. And so one of the cities uh, that are left for us to explore and, and do research on from those people is Mohenjo-Daro. And Mohenjo-Daro is pretty famous because its remains are, 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 are vitrified. So it seems like they were literally melted uh, together to a point where it's solid rock nowadays, but their construction was completely different to the Minoans. So they came from the same time period, but their environments were very different. Crete is very rocky, but in Mohenjo-Daro, we don't really have rocks like that. And so construction was done primarily with mud bricks. People would take this clay and shape uniform uh, bricks out of it. They were very convenient uh, to be used for architecture. And so these structures they look differently because they were built with different construction materials. Uh, and I believe there's actually a page in this file that puts next to each other a few uh, different features of society because becoming an urbanized city requires lots of storage rooms. You need granaries to store food for the people that are not farming. Uh, and you also need public spaces like courtyards and you need 
um, bathhouses. And so there's definitely similarities between these cultures, but it's interesting how a different environment has required very different construction techniques. Hmm. Hmm. That's uh, very interesting. Uh, how can we implement uh, these ideas into our modern like uh, society um, that you've learned oh, from the uh, Bacchanalans? There's a lot to learn from these, uh, from these people because they were so uh, adamant on using local materials for construction and, 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 and their solutions were very inventive. And so we can, we can take, uh, yeah, we can definitely take pieces of advice from that. When you think about the construction of the Minoans, they built for a particular climate. So it's dry, it's hot, uh, it's very sunny. And uh, when it does rain, uh, that rain is not very, uh, very common. So you want to capture that rain. And so in the design of those structures, you see that there was uh, attention being paid to the capture of rainwater, which is really important for being able to sustain yourself as you need access to fresh water. It's usually number uno for, uh, for, what, for what matters. So capturing rainwater was done by these uh, light wells that had the basin at the bottom. It's almost similar to how you would find that in an ancient uh, Roman, uh, Roman thermopylae, like a house surrounding like a hole in the roof into which rain would come in into a pool. Um, so this is something that was done very intelligently by the Minoans. They, they captured their water and they used a very smart systems to ventilate their homes. So you want to climate control your spaces and you want to make sure that it's a pleasant temperature in there. And to do this, they uh, use these constructions in Knossos that are called uh, polythyrons. And polythyrons are basically um, posts, uh, like three doors next to each other. Imagine three doors next to each other with a lintel on top. So you have two columns and a lintel on top, creating three doors. And then above it, you would have three square openings. Now, inside of these columns would be doors that would have the ability to fold in and out. And that's what created this particular structure. So when you wanted to, you could close the doors, have privacy, but then there would still be air coming in through the top. And during the day, when you open everything up, wind would be able to pass through uh, the palace, through all the corridors, these grand staircases. And so you uh, cool down the structure by allowing wind to get in. You minimize the amount of light that gets in through these light wells, minimal windows, and um, being very smart about how you heat up the space. And so that way you can, uh, you can keep your house comfortable without spending any money on fans or, <laughs> or yeah. air conditioning, which they didn't have anyway. So it's yeah. a, it's a, that, that's something that's, that's definitely worth taking from the Minoans is the use of local materials. How do you use them in a smart way to build hmm. walls, to build, uh, to build structures that are strong against earthquakes, and then to build multiple stories high, which is of course kind of insane if you think about it. Back then they were building up to about five stories high because of these construction techniques that they had inherited from the Egyptians. Hmm. Now, it's important though to note that these structures uh, on Crete, they were on a much more human scale than what you might find in the temples in Mesopotamia or Egypt. When you visit those temples, everything is so enormous. Uh, and that's definitely not the case at Knossos. Everything was more at the scale for human interaction. Hmm. So that's, yeah, yeah that's very interesting. Uh, I, that's what, I, what I'm more familiar with is like the psychology of that time. Because I read this book called, uh, and I've mentioned in previous episode as well, uh, The Origin of Consciousness and the Breakdown of the Bicameral Mind by Julian James. And in this book, they mention how our hemispheres were uh, working differently. And um, so it was believed that before the Greeks and their intellectual height, that is where we switch, switched or we switch, uh, 
yeah, we changed our perception to left brain more oriented from right brain. And from the right brain, it was believed that they uh, just follow up with the words uh, from the gods that they can, that they um, listen to. They got yeah. commandments from the gods and they said, you know, we should build like this architecture like this. Uh, maybe you see some examples of like, uh, and for example, the Sumerians, they talk about how they received uh, a lang written language and the time from the gods. Is there something similar like that um, in the Manoa civilization, as far as you know? Um, as far as I know, um, we know very little, but what I have read about uh, the Minoans is that they, they, did, they did worship a pantheon of gods, so mm -hmm. not, uh, not a single god. However, the most important would have been the sun. And since the bull represented the sun, uh, that probably means that they were also worshiping other planetary or uh, celestial bodies. Now, the whole reason why we have an age of Taurus is because during that age, for these Minoans, on the March equinox, the sun would rise in the constellation of Taurus. And mm -hmm. so observing the celestial and astrological events has probably been, has probably been like a, a large part of their ceremonies, their religious uh, rituals, and their, uh, their, their the possibility that there was some kind of communication going on with spirits uh, or with gods in these religious ceremonies. Sadly, though, because we have no, no written records, that, that would all be um, just, just guess, guessing. And, and, and we can read into the symbology of what they were trying to do. I think that it is very interesting to note what you just said about a switch from supposed right side uh, oriented to left side oriented, because that would correspond with a shift from the age of Taurus to the age of Aries, because Taurus represents creativity, it represents trade, and Aries kind of represents the analytical mind and war. And so the shift in consciousness might be connected to this shift in thinking if we're talking about astrology impacting the human psyche. Yeah, yeah, because that's something that you see in other civilizations as well. What I'm most familiar with is the Incas, because I uh, visited Peru, and I talked with some uh, um, people who were from that tradition or related to it or studied it. Um, some of them told me that uh, these ancient sites, they're mostly connected with the stars, and they didn't just do it for, uh, you know, reasons of farming or organic reasons or uh, but they also did it for mental reasons. And I think that's why a lot of these ancient sites had these connections with uh, astrology and with uh, or astronomy, because, yeah. you know, they believed that had an influence on their, on their psyche and uh, that mm -hmm. the, the gods were like communicating through these uh, star patterns. And that's also probably how we, we see all these patterns in the star and how we, created it. So for me, it's very logical to assume that, that our way of thinking was probably very different in, in history than what we are, you know, um, what we yeah. are familiar with right now. I think that when we're trying to look for reasons why our ancestors might have worshipped or might have been so obsessed with astronomy, astrology, the sun, the moon, the cycles of, of nature, I think we could, we could explain that by, by viewing our ancestors as people that were very in touch with the fact that they are part of nature and that we all are, are part of one creation. And nowadays, we seem to have lost that connection. We feel separate from nature. We yeah. feel like we, we're doing things to nature and so we're not seeing how we're actually doing things to ourselves when we're harming nature. And studying things like the movement of the sun and of the stars and of the moon, of the seasons, that's intimately related 
to our own lives. And people were way more in touch back then, I think is the only way to explain that. They yeah. felt that by studying these things, they were studying themselves and they weren't being fanciful and wasting their time. No, they were actually, um, they were actually discovering what it means to be human. I think that uh, one thing I don't agree with, I don't think they were studying themselves because they don't have a conception of themselves. Yeah, that is something that came much later. So they had these, uh, you know, just um, that there were puppets like the, of the gods themselves. It's very difficult for us to step into, but I think that we'll, we'll transition in where uh, the next days will be where we uh, see both sides, that we see uh you know the, the the voice of the gods of the spirits or uh just the holy other or what some people call god or the higher self but also what we are experiencing in our material life you know uh, what we would call our ego that we merge these two together and that we bridge both hemispheres there's different techniques for techniques for this as well uh, not to go too much off topic but um uh, yeah i think it's very fascinating now uh, these ancient civilizations, they, they, they knew so, so much, but they also had a very different approach to ours. So that's why I think it's important to study them and, and not just for the architecture and not just for astrology, but for a lot of different reasons. Uh, would you agree? Yeah, so if, if, I, if I understand you correctly, what you were saying is that before we made this switch, like, like the book you read states that Mm -hmm. uh, but like in the transition, like in, in the Greek society or around that time frame, we made a switch to a, from, a, from a right brain to a left brain uh, dominant person. You feel like before we made that switch, we hadn't really individualized, realizing that we are responsible for our own actions and instead just seeing ourselves as an extension of nature working through us. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a very complex idea, uh, but um, it is something that our, our consciousness just switched in where we, and that's through words, we, we and through written words more specifically, that we learn to objectify and we eventually objectify ourselves uh, and we call ourselves, you know, this is me, uh, but uh, the, the ancients, they had these oral traditions and they, they had, with that, a total different perception of consciousness itself, I would, I would, I don't know, I yes. would think. That's what I think that there is, a, I, I think that there is merit to this idea. I think that it's, it's likely that at some point, we didn't really have an ego. And at some point, like, like, we might have operated as a troop, like, like, we might see primates operating in the jungle now really becoming individualized because they're such a group animal still. Um, however, I would, I would think that that shift might have actually happened earlier than this, than, than, than this theory proposes, because looking at the Minoans who precede the Greeks by, by a few hundred years, um, they were already uh, being ruled by a monarch. And so they already had a hierarchy and uh, the buildings that were found at, um, at the palace, they seem to point very strongly to a, an early form of government, an early form of religion. Uh, we have different, different types of uh, specialized laborers and, and workshops. Yeah, and, and, and what about the writing? Because I think you mentioned something about that. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. so they, 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 they actually have their own writing called Linear A. And Linear mm. A, has not been uh, deciphered because we don't have enough of the keyboards yet. Yeah, but that, uh, that just makes uh, your point much stronger that they probably changed in their perception because they had a written language uh, yeah. before. It might have had, so it might have happened before these Greeks. Maybe it, it was at, at, like, at like the earliest, like it could have been the Phoenicians. It could have been something else entirely, but it's very interesting to theorize about this because there's things that point very strongly towards a shift in, in, in human consciousness and becoming more individualized. But um, I'm just thinking about the pyramids here. Like it would be so much easier to construct those as human beings if you're actually not an individual, but if you're operating 
as a group and as a hive mind almost. I don't mm. know. I don't know. It's just something that 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 that, that becomes interesting to consider. I know that there is a spiritual uh, there's a spiritual doctrine that talks about uh, that talks about the idea of unified planets where all of the spirits or all of the souls on the planet have started becoming unified into one single consciousness. And I think that might that might be that might be connected to this idea. Uh, it's, it's a, a unified planet. Yeah, yeah. So uh, there's this um, there's this literature surrounding uh, channelings done by uh, oh my goodness I forgot the good lady's name. This uh, this is the the law of one, which you probably have heard of. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, it's supposedly brought down by by this this creature from Venus. And um, if uh, if the story is correct, all the all the beings on Venus started resonating with each other in such a way that their minds kind of melded together into a single consciousness that has access to everybody's memories at all times, yet still operates as individual beings. Hmm. All right. Yeah, I've never heard about that. I'm not that familiar with uh, love one. I did teach it to children though, uh, and the simplest, sim the simple version of. Yeah, uh, yeah how it's really the, the 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 less somehow it's like the less you know about the law of one, the better, because it's really easy to over uh, uh, like, like uh, overthink it. It really just is the fact that we are all one. Yeah, and, if and that's so the fact that we're all one, then that's, that's as far as you need to carry that message, really. As yeah. soon as you start to expand on that, you start to introduce the idea of duality, polarity, and other laws. Well, something, something that, that is in I Ching is that they don't see it as, as a oneness, but more as a, 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 a shared, a shared uh, manifestation or where uh, there's a, like a lot of, uh, they, they, make these sections which are connected to dna with 64 um they say like the manifestation experience is is all like through these different codes of ones and zeros you know like the they have these lines and they say that that, the, that that's not just simply one but that it is actually like parts of 64 um that is manifests in reality itself um I don't know if you're familiar with the I Ching. Uh, I, I've heard about something that sounds like it's similar, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it, it could also be interpreted as the universe being made up out of certain sounds, and that these sounds together can shape everything, but can be boiled down to some really simple sounds. Uh, um, that, that, yeah. that, that form everything underneath. Yeah, like, like frequencies. Really Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, well, I, I often look to uh, Jeffrey Mislav, uh, New Thinking Aloud. He is a parapsychologist and he, he has this uh, yin yang symbol, uh, but not the traditional one. He has it, and, and my symbol is a little bit inspired by this uh, the color spectrum, but it like uh, polarizes each other. So the opposite of the color are on the other side of the spectrum. And I know that colors is also connected with like certain frequencies and how yes. our brain interprets these different colors. So maybe there's so even that the Minoans knew something about that and, and, and uh, that's why they chose the colors that they did because I see a lot of red in their architecture. There's a lot of red. So there's of course, the, 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 there's a few ways to explain this. And one of them, of course, the simplest explanation would be that they have access to red. And so they use it more, but not just red. Another color that comes across a lot in their artwork is blue. They use yellow, green, and black. And so mm. these frescoes, these reliefs that they uh, created, they're, 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 very, they're very special because not, there's not just two dimensional paintings on a flat wall. They actually create the limestone, um, limestone facings that have like a low relief to it. So when you would pass your hand over it, there's actually a, a, a small impression. And so when they have the bull, the bull is actually kind of three-dimensional. Everything that they paint was three-dimensional. The flowers, the people, 
And so you could actually like feel it on the wall as well. Um, they must have under, uh, had some type of understanding of color because uh, they were very, very, um, they were very determined in which colors that they used. Hmm. And blue seems to have definitely been a part of the, 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 the female fashion. All of these women are depicted in blue and white robes. And I guess if we're talking about the, the, the meaning of certain colors, blue is always kind of represented truth, speaking truth. Well, oh, so like it relates to the throat chakra as well and wisdom. Uh, and so it could be that uh, they made these connections as well. Hmm. Oh, right. That's uh, very interesting. And, and, and I've also known that you do uh, something with, and that motivated you to be interested in uh, architecture is, um, and that's something we're going to talk about more in, in the second part, uh, but self-sufficient uh, building, is that correct? Yes. Or the earth and the earthship in, in yeah, particular, for, for, right? For me, yeah, for me, like, I, um, I, I came across this, this thing called earthships. And I'm sure many people have come across them at this point because it's become very popular uh, online to watch videos of people with tiny houses and people yeah. going off the grid, building their own little home inside of a van or a school bus because we're, we're definitely in the middle of another one of these transitions in our consciousness. Yes. And uh, moving into the age of Aquarius, a lot of people seem to want to escape they seem to want to be able to uh, like set yeah. themselves free. And yeah, one that's... way that we can do that is by separating ourselves from the grid, from the power grid, from the governmental grid, from the road grid even. Uh, and so it's, this has always fascinated me as soon as I learned about it. Hmm. Uh, All right, so let's, let's talk about that in the second part. Uh, but before, let's take a five to 10 minute break and um, return to it. Sounds good. All right. See you in a bit. All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Uh, this is the second part. And in this part, we're going to talk about uh, sustainability and off the grid living and also the, especially the earthship um, and like different concepts, maybe. But uh, if you, what, what research have you done on, on the sustainability? Are you living in a sustainable house or? you know someone or did you just do a lot of research or what, what is your what is your knowledge and maybe you can share it some with us yes yeah sure so uh, I'm, I'm currently actually just just renting a, a cottage uh, here in treasure beach it's not it's not very sustainable at all uh, but uh, i've always been fascinated with sustainable building and it's one of the reasons why i, I got really into architecture and wanting to learn about architecture and practice it. So and at this point, I'm sure everybody that's kind of heard of an earthship knows about a community that exists in New Mexico where uh, they have this whole area in the desert with a collection of earthships. And these, these, these people that built them, they've been there experimenting for the past few decades with different models of how to create a home that does not take any energy from the grid. It, it produces all of its own electricity. Uh, it captures all of its own water and it recycles everything uh, to the point where nothing gets wasted. And so it, it provides a way of living in a way that's completely independent. It also produces enough food for the inhabitants to never have to leave and go to the grocery store. And so this is the ultimate self-sustainability. Mm. And the design of these homes in a lot of ways does not look like a regular house. And they, they take on very organic shapes because in order to build in a way that sustains energy, you have to take advice and learn from different natural systems that already exist on planet earth and implement those. So it has always interested me because it, it, it relates to this concept of biomimicry and biomimicry 
basically means we mimic or we try to reproduce something that we see in nature to produce better technology for ourselves. And so we might study a bird and the way a bird uses its wings uh, with different angles to create better performing planes. Mm-hmm. And uh, similarly, we might, uh, we might look at how, um, how, how like a fish moves to create a better bow for a boat. Is, is that like an architectural term? Or Bio, is it biomimicry uh, actually extends to uh, all design. So it's not just uh, construction. You can use biomimicry in, in, in many different ways. Hmm. So you use it for you use it in biology. You use it in engineering and architecture. You can uh, even uh, use it in in mathematics because when you create mathematical formulas for for natural phenomena, you really start to get to the language. Of Okay, because it reminds me of like what they say in permaculture, uh, with especially Victor Schauberger. He said uh, we should study nature or comprehend nature, and we should imitate it. So it's very similar to what you're saying, uh, but I'm not familiar with the term in, 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 that you're using. But um, are you familiar with Victor Schauberger and his work? No, no, uh, it, it definitely sounds like he's touching upon uh, the same idea where uh, we can really use the things we learn from observing nature to build things that are better suited to planet Earth. Yeah, uh, yeah. It, it makes a lot of sense. I actually, well, uh, yeah, I actually, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, um, well, he also says that uh, we're using mostly combustible energy and all these you know, everything that's based on explosion, uh, yes. gases and, and all these things, but we should ch- transition into implosion. So that is a completely different form of energy that we're not really that familiar with, but he, you know, you're probably familiar with like zero point energy and, you know, uh, yeah, we're talking about sustainability. So you need to provide your own energy and can do this through, uh, through, through solar panels. Um, but the solar panels are used by, are made by plastic and, and just still require oil. So we still have to or invest in that, or we have to find another way of, of, of uh, like getting electricity. And that's what uh, Victor Schauberger told about with his, uh, with his work. Um, mm-hmm. He tried to reproduce like a, um, a spiral machine where we can harness this energy. Uh, but uh, as far as I, I saw a documentary on it, and they could not, uh, he didn't succeed it. But uh, there is, could be still like some things that we don't know about that, and which is hidden from us. But are oh, you yes. familiar with that? Like, I, I am, time? I am. Like, I, I would have to admit, like, I'm a, I'm a Tesla fanboy, and everybody that has done research into Tesla knows that he, he either came very close to this type of technology, or he did invent it and it got covered up. We uh, we don't know for sure, but what we do know uh, is that uh, in, our, in our planetary atmosphere, the, the little thin layer around our crust that contains all of the oxygen that we can breathe uh, and the perfect balance with nitrogen, uh, that there's all of these free electrons that are floating around in, in this layer of our atmosphere called the ionosphere. And so Tesla, um, was able to capture the energy from the sky, similar to how we see lightning form, that is coming from somewhere. That's coming from those electrons that are being discharged when we see lightning. But there is much larger phenomena that are going on in the layers above lightning. When lightning strikes, there's sprites and halos and massive phenomena that light up the sky. They look like uh, aurora borealis. Um, and that's because we can, it's a gas that is literally ignited when, when there's a discharge like that that takes place. So energy, electricity is literally all around us. Mm. And so it does not make sense for us to strip our mother earth from all of its oil, destroy the crust of the earth to then run generators that produce electricity. If electricity is literally all around us for free, we're doing our planet a massive disservice 
by continuing to use oil to generate electricity. It makes no sense at all. Supposedly, Tesla drove around in an electric car in like 1888. Like I might get that date completely wrong. In my, but mm. the thing is, like there's pictures of him in a car driving around with, uh, with a woman and the car is not powered by anything except electricity. And so supposedly he understood that there is a connection between water in the ground and this electricity in the sky. And we, we, we might be familiar with this tower that he built uh, yeah. way out into, in, in the middle of nowhere somewhere uh, to uh, get the power from the, uh, from the sky by building a pipe that went deep into the ground and stuck up like a tower with one of those Tesla coils. So supposedly it's not a random location and Tesla built that site on the location of a massive aquifer, like a big lake of water that's in the earth's crust. So it's not a lake above water, but there's like a big amount of water that is located underneath the earth. And similar, by the way, as the Giza Plateau, the pyramids are also built on an aquifer. Hmm. Uh, and so there might be a connection there, but anyway, he was able to drill into the ground with a metal rod who went up into the sky and was able to generate a wireless type of electricity that would go for miles around. And so he was walking around, I guess, like mad light bulbs, and he was literally able to just stick the light bulb into the ground and it would light up because there's all this charged electricity. And he, uh, he would have used this to power the World Fair that was hosted by uh, J.P. Morgan, his, uh, his sponsor. But then, uh, uh, you know, infamously, uh, when he was asked, okay, so where's the meter? How do we put a meter on this? How do we charge people for this type of power? He, uh, he, he supposedly said that no way to put a measuring uh, device on this. This is free energy. This is for everyone. Uh, and that's when JP Morgan would have had his tower torn down and the research kind of destroyed or confiscated because it was threatening to his oil empire. Mm. Uh, yeah, yeah, I want to explain uh, why, why I talk about zero point energy. Also because, um, you know, for like an off the grid building uh, that I'm in, in right now, and also with the Earthship, it, they could only require like a so, some solar panels and some um, like some windmills. Uh, you can get some, some small of the uh, smaller versions. Um, but um, the thing about um, our society, and if we really want this transition um, to, into a more sustainable way of living, then we have to face that problem as well. What we're used currently using with our cars and uh, with our houses. So like in Amsterdam, we cannot live in a, or in another big city, you cannot live off the grid there or, or have these solar panels on your roof. So you need solutions like that, that are uh, radical in the sense that um, they are based on a totally different principle that we're still uh, with our materialistic view are familiar with. And then we think about our external world and how we can and take something like a product, uh, it may be gases or may be electricity. Um, but I think this transition will come. And uh, I find it also very interesting what the psychology is behind, like why people transition into this way of thinking. Uh, you mentioned something about the spiral uh, earlier and, and the spiral is also connected to mother earth in different cultures. Like in the in the Andes, uh, in the Inca tradition, they have Pachamama, which is symbolized by the spiral as well. Um, there's probably some, I think the Greek uh, goddess uh, Gaia, this was also symbolized by the spiral. Uh, the spiral was used to harness um, the energy that Victor Schaber would want to try to produce. But uh, we don't have all his records, and uh, some parts were missing, so that's why they couldn't like totally complete it, and they probably abandoned the uh, search for it. Uh, but um, it's just very fascinating to me how all these civilizations 
uh, had these ties together and they, they were connected to, to nature. And yeah, you've mentioned about the Manoan civilization where they used electricity, uh, yeah. or I mean, no electricity, oh. that they had these fans and they had a natural sewer system and you can see it with Incas as well. And, and, and we yeah, it's very primitive. That. Very primitive. It's primitive, but it's it's sufficient in, in the way yes. that it doesn't require any energy that we have to take from nature. So in that sense, they're more advanced than we were. Um, but um, the thing about self-sustainable living, I'm like currently right now in a, in a farm from the 1800s and, and we have about two acres around here. It's not completely self-sufficient in that we don't have our own power. Uh, we rely still on sun gas. Uh, we um, uh, take some food from the grocery store as well, an organic store. Uh, so we don't have all the food provided for ourselves. And it's just, they started about a few years ago, like four or five years ago. So it's still like on the beginning and they're like building a cellar soon uh, where they can still store food uh, yes. on the ground level. So, but living in the reality of, of, of off and off the grid, it's very difficult to achieve that uh, self-sustainability because like, for example, clothes are very I bought it from the store. So you have to, like a lot of things we still and the laptop and, and they're, we're still part of society. Um, mm -hmm. But the thing with permaculture is that we try to minimize our impact. Um, we reuse a lot of things. Like they hear, like they check my phone, like there's some, some things wrong with it and they use uh, flashlights to look inside and, and, and correct if they if they can. And they try to do everything themselves and reuse like uh, the uh, the plastic or um, the glass bottles. Like everything is composting the the, the the remains of fruit or giving it to the chickens or to the yes. uh, goats. And, and in that way, you know, we minimize our effect. And that is something at least that we can do. Uh, but we have to think more uh, deeply and, and look at these ra radical, seemingly uh, radical ideas of uh, off the grid, or I mean, uh, zero point energy and uh, other solutions that can provide a, an effect on a bigger scale than just having this beautiful space that we're in, that I'm in right now with uh, this farm and um, the people in it and the experience that you can have here. But, uh, we need to reach all people eventually, so we have to uh, dig into these ideas and there's a lot of suppression also. Um, it's why I'm a little bit careful, like I'm not going to give a layout and how to build those things because I don't know. And I think if you would market them, and that's also what Nikola Tesla had um, some experiences with, and in that way uh, that, that if you market these things or you try to you know, um, extend it to the general population, then you get stopped by these big uh, companies that want you to um, be attached to them, you know, because they can make a profit out of you. So well, you get an option. It's, it's you choose silver or you choose lead. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, that's, it's just the corruption in our society. And you know, I've talked about this a lot in a previous episode um, for people who haven't seen it, check it out. Um, but yeah, it's just, just where uh, it's very difficult to make the transition right now. A lot of people, they you know, with this uh, pandemic that we're in, like in a you know, common day, a lot of people they cling more onto the system, and other people they get more pulled away from the system, you know, and they yes. try to start their own thing. So, so I I, I don't want to be negative uh, about the about about the idea of self sustainability. I think that that is is really amazing to to aim to be as as self reliant as possible. But I have to I have to also be a be a realist in the fact that I I, I really like I really like uh, being on the internet, and I'm never gonna learn how to build my own computer. I'm always gonna rely on somebody else for my computer and. Uh, for example, my wife, my wife is like one year away from finishing medical school. She's a doctor. I would, uh, I wouldn't want to have to learn how to take care of myself. And so any society that is going to be self-sustainable, any, any group of people would have to include medical professionals. And we cannot do everything ourselves. And therefore, I think that when you want to live self-sustainably, you 
I have to imagine that in a, in, a, in, a, in a community with other people that are doing the same thing. And you're all working towards the goal of being self-reliant, but with that comes the responsibility to operate in a group because nobody can live on a farm and grow enough food for themselves and, and make their own clothes and do everything themselves. It's just very, very tough. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, 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 and therefore, if we, if we think about communities on a small, on a small scale, um, we, can, we can achieve much more. Yeah. And like li living and living together with like uh, and, 20 and people he, is already great, but 200 is even better. Yeah, that's, that's what I mentioned here as well, because they, they have a lot of work here. But if you could connect all this, uh, not just one community, but connect in multiples. And then like, if you have a lot of potatoes and someone else has a lot of fruit, then you can like exchange it. So what you want to is to expand this, you know, and don't want it to uh, be based upon uh, keeping it too small. Uh, you want to ex um, keep uh, investing in that you shorten the time that you have to build or to uh, yeah. harvest. And, and make and grow as much food as possible and as, on as little surface as possible. And so that's yeah, why permaculture is really important. Yeah, but, but the thing is, right, if you have a lot of food, um, you cannot store them for very long. Like they are going to build a shelter and you can store them in some fridges. But it's, it's, you know, with food, it's not always good to have as, lo as much as possible. Or you sell them or you give them away, of course, and maybe we can trade it for something. Yeah, if you, can, if you can sell it, then the money that is made by the community can be used to acquire other things or to keep the lights on, pay the power bill for the farm, uh, those types of things. Yeah. So you, when you create a, a surplus of food, more than you can eat with the, with the group of people that uh, you're living with, then, then you're starting to become more and more self-reliant because money is sadly always going to be a part of the equation. At mm. least in the world we're living in right now, uh, as a community, you can grow as much food as you want, but you're going to also need an ability to make a little bit of money. And so if you have people that are making really cool artwork or clothes in the community, you want to bring those to the, out of the community and, and make, get good money for them so that you can invest that back into the community. But if, like, uh, like, like, for example, you need um, something that needs to happen on the farm that nobody is skilled at, maybe it could be something like plumbing. You might need new pipe work, but nobody really knows how to do that well. So you have somebody else come in from the outside. You'll always need money in a self-reliable world. Yeah. Whatever form or shape it takes, it could be food too. It could be it could be other products that you produce, but. Uh, what is being produced at the farm that you're, that you're uh, currently living in? Uh, well, I see a lot of pumpkins. We have a lot of tomatoes. Also have some mice from Peru. Uh, we have um, what else? a lot of uh, uh, different uh, herbs, uh, also for tea. Uh, but like I said, it's, it's just starting. Like There's three different parts. And there's like the, a lot of cabbages as well. And then... Uh, a lot of things that are still, it's not completely self-sufficient yet, so they have to build a lot more. Um, and I will definitely help out and do what I can and for the short time I'm still here. Um, but it's just uh, a starting project still. And, and something that is important to mention is that if you're growing food, you should always check out what they grow locally and what the climate is there, because then you can maximize and and, and, and I've seen on the internet some pretty interesting systems for maximizing growth of food. Um, so here, there's are you pretty... talking about uh, about guilds? Um, no, I'm not necessarily familiar with that. But I was thinking about um, there's a guy that built these um, like a dome, a, like a cage, and he has like these chickens in this cage, and then he moves this cage around on his field. So he can like let the chicken like shit out everywhere, and they yeah. they make the stamp around to mix up the soil. Yeah, create, exactly. Yeah, create better soil. Yeah, yeah that's a, that's a great way to replenish the soil because I think what what's attractive about permaculture is that it is kind of the opposite of the way they do farming in say where where we're from in Friesland. Yeah. You'll like have a field, sure. and the the field is. Um, it's just one crop. It's like a field full of potato or a field full of corn. 
And then next year, it's full of corn again. And every year they harvest one type of crop from the same field. But after doing this over and over again, they're going to have to keep adding cow manure to the field to make it more fertile because the soil is slowly losing its fertility. It's losing its, its, it, the, all of the nutrients that are in there. And if you keep growing the same thing in what's called a monoculture, you actually, uh, over time, you make the yeah. soil very weak. And yeah. so permaculture uses all of these different uh, guilds uh, where you basically, you get like a tree. For example, you have a fruit tree that works really well. It creates these beautiful fruits. And then right around the base of the tree, you plant shrubbery, like bushes, that'll grow up uh, to a medium height. And so you have two layers there, where one, one, is a type of, uh, one is a type of berry that grows on the bush, and then there might be some fruit that grows on the tree. But then underneath that, you can also have shrubs, which are like a lower pl plant, like a pumpkin, for example, that will grow across the ground uh, and, and use, use the plants to kind of weed through. And then underground, you would place things like potatoes and things that grow underneath the soil. And so there are certain sets of fruit producing guilds are called, they're called that way. It's like a combination of a certain fruit tree, shrubbery, uh, bush and, and, and ground provision that creates a cycle. And so the fruit that drops on the ground adds nutrients to the soil. Then like the berry bush might take up those nutrients but those berries that fall down, they provide a certain type of nutrient or mineral that then makes the ground provision really strong. And when you have something like this, you don't need to pay a lot of attention to it because it is a self-sufficient guild of plants. You don't even need to water it as much because they, it's, it's taking care of itself. And all you need to do when you create a forest like this in a real permaculture way is just go through there and harvest every now and then. Just harvest, and if you feel like, oh, this is growing too big over here, you can prune it a little bit, but you don't need to till the soil and, and add fertilizer. You don't need to water it a lot because you've designed a, a, a garden that kind of recycles everything itself. And that's that's what, what is so fascinating about permaculture. Mm, mm. Yeah, we'll definitely learn a lot more in the coming times. Now, what you're saying, I, I haven't heard it in, in someone put it in that way. Um, but it's, uh, are you familiar with biodynamic farming? Um, how, that's from Ru Rudolf Steiner. That's the person I'm a little bit more familiar with. Is, it, is, is, is this the man who incorporates like fish ponds uh, with, uh, with gardens? Uh, not as I know, but maybe it could be, I don't know. But um, he connects all these plants with uh, certain planets, like we were mentioning astrology before. Ah, okay. And um, so like certain plants, they have their correlations. Uh, Camilla, I know that it was with, no, I, I don't know for sure actually, uh, but I thought it was with uh, Mercury. Uh, but um, they, the, the Camilla, they are very like, they break up the soil. They are very, their roots are very strong. So they can make room for other plants that, that grow on later. And they had these uh, correlations with mercury and, and they say that, you know, the correlations, if you make tea out of it, for example, helps with certain, like the mercury is, I don't know for sure, but I think it, a certain part of your body it's connected with and it can help out with that. And that is an idea that, that is in uh, biodynamics. And there's another idea that they're and what you already talked about with the cycles, uh, we produce in our regular farming, we produce as much as potatoes, but they, the potatoes cannot reproduce themselves because they are produced in, or uh, made in this way that they're supposed to like grow as much as possible, but they don't carry a lot of nutrition and they're not able, capable to make their own seeds and reproduce again. And that is something that Rudolf Steiner's like found very important that the plants went through the total cycle um, and that they completed this cycle, just like humans do. And this cycle is working with other cycles. And that is something that yeah. is within permaculture as well. Uh, but Rudolf Steiner, he was very uh, spiritual and very uh, philosophic. And he believed that plants are intelligent and are sacred. And if you treat the life as that, and you have this relationship, 
and that also has an effect on plants as well. Oh, yes, yes. I, I have a relationship like this, for example, with my basil plants, because I don't let them go through their full cycle. Like I, I have basil plants and I, I harvest like the basil leaves or make a pesto or I make like a nice salad, a bruschetta, or, and I put it in my pasta sauces. And so naturally I want to keep my plants alive. However, uh, basil is an annual and so it, it would live for one year, it grows tall, and then at the ends, they will start producing these white flowers. And the white flowers will then spread the plant seed. And after the flower bloom, the plant has fulfilled its cycle and will basically die. It will just wallow, it will, it will, it will just shut down because it's finished and it spread its seed. And I, I'm, Naturally, I don't want my basic plant to go. Uh, I can avoid that by every time that I see these white flowers come up, I pick, the, I pick the white flowers from the basil plant. And the cycle is basically like I, I, I sever the loop and the plant remains for another year. Hmm. Uh, uh, so we do have a connection to this. Like it's not like we, we, we can interact with these cycles. So we can observe them, but we can interact as well. And that's kind of our power in, in, in astrology and in as human beings. It's like, okay, once we observe these patterns, once we rec register the cycles, we can influence them as well. Yeah. And we can use them to our advantage as well. So yeah. it makes sense that like a chamomile or like in the Camille, like uh, is, a, is connected to a certain planet or a certain, or a certain idea certain um, archetype or certain types yes. of the light, 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 the, uh, concept that we have. It, 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 I guess that would relate to as above, so below. It's, mm -hmm. It seems like it might come from alchemy. Yeah. Uh, where, 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 where herbs and plants are connected to planetary bodies. Um, that's very interesting because there are connections with, with certain plants that will, that will bloom uh, and, and, and like only during the full moon, for example, and uh, so there, there, there are connections there that are worth investigating. Mm, for sure, for sure. Uh, yeah, I don't remember the Nicholas Farmel. No, that was an alchemist as well. But there was another mm -hmm. guy, and he he's the founder of like natural medicine. But he started he researched into uh, uh, alchemy as well, and he. Um, I don't know. He, he, he which, had, uh, which time period was this? I, this was during the Renaissance. Uh, oh, I so went Rosicrucians? To, yeah, no, I don't know if he was a Rosicrucian. Uh, maybe I can find him, but he was the... Um, he was a alchemist that uh, invented natural medicine that we have today. Oh, okay, okay. But uh, yeah, I cannot know his name for now. No, because Nicholas Flamel was the guy who was all about transmutation of elements and the uh, yeah. philosopher's stone, right? Yeah, yeah. So that's Nicholas... a, like a way to achieve immortality. Uh, yeah, yeah. He was like looking for a way to become immortalized. And the movie that I mentioned in my previous podcast, that it with uh, uh, Derek from Awaken Your Mind. Uh, yeah. We talked about this uh, movie as well, uh, but I, I visited the house of uh, um, Nicolas Romel uh, in Paris. So oh. it's one of the oldest buildings uh, supposedly there. Uh, right now there's a restaurant inside. So, but I didn't went inside, but I just saw the front of the house. And there were a lot of uh, like symbols uh, on, on on the wall. Mm -hmm. um, couldn't decipher them all, but uh, yeah, I, I'm also very familiar with that guy, but uh, you know, I'm looking here through all the names of all the yeah. famous it's, alchemists. Yeah, it's those symbols that really speak to the imagination. I, I remember what, what, what really what really draw, drew me to like learning about alchemy was this this grave that I found. I was in, a, in the graveyard that's across the street from from my dad's uh, apartment in Snake, uh, in Frisia. And as I, was, as I was leaving this graveyard, I noticed this, this big, uh, 
no, it was like a, a little crypt. And this graveyard is pretty old. And so there's a bunch of graves from 18, 18 whatever. And this grave stood out because it had the Ouroboros on the grave. And I was like, oh, that's an interesting symbol. I've never seen it. It's a serpent that goes around in a circle and bites itself in its tail. Mm. And so I Googled that. I was like, Google, like, so like snake biting its own tail. And it's just like going down the rabbit hole. Like it was a very interesting uh, discovery to find like, oh, that, that must have been like some kind of alchemist's grave or somebody that was really into that symbology and had it put on their gravestone. Uh, Mm. But, yeah, I, I, you know, I, uh, I found the name. It's Paracelsus. Paracelsus. Yes, that, that makes sense. Paracelsus. I've heard that name before. Uh, yeah, well, we're drifting a little bit off of topic here, but it's, uh, it's fine. Uh, alchemy is also yeah. a very interesting subject. And it also has to do with, with transitioning yeah, from one substance into another. And that's what we're going to do with, with uh, self-sufficient living as well, uh, transitioning. Mm -hmm uh into another way of living i guess uh is there some some things you have planned uh you're living right now in jamaica uh with with self sufficiently yeah. uh are you going to build I, something uh, there or i have uh, i have uh, plans to yes so it's 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 my goal to, to build a house here um hopefully multiple you know as as, as an architectural career but i uh, i really want to experiment with building i think that's really that's really something that i that i feel most guided to do at this stage in my life i am uh, learning about architecture learning about history and the history of architecture yeah. and i want to um I, I want to take part in that for me studying history is always related to architecture because that's really the only thing that remains after hundreds or thousands of years it's the buildings that we can study and learn from yeah, that's probably why Nicholas Fomel had these uh, symbols on his wall as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and the first building you should build is the temple within, I would say. <laughs> it's true. It's true. You know, that's, uh, that's, that's what I honestly think that whole uh, transmutation is about in alchemy. It's, uh, it's about self-realization. And so you really see immortality once you transmute yourself from a material body into the waveform that is actually like manifesting that material body yeah yeah sure yeah um uh, sorry Getting but i was at, yeah caught you yeah, off no, no 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 that's okay that's okay i um i i feel like it's it's been my goal to, to kind of incorporate the, this type of uh this type of thinking into the design of a nurse ship uh by by including all of this sacred geometry and, and kind of like frequency hmm. imagery and uh I, what what I, made I you know. choose uh, Earthship? What is the uh, reason? Why? Because there is well, a lot of different tiny houses and yeah, yeah. So I, I'm 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 drawn to all types of architecture, and so in my career, I do not want to focus only on Earthships. I want to I, I like I I do anything. I design bus stops or hospitals and airports. I don't I like it. To me, it's design that that is that is the most uh, tantalizing aspect. But mm. Earthships are like a hobby of mine. I researched it a lot in the past, and now it's something that's on my bucket list. Like I want to design this building that has the ability to grow food and uh, power itself and basically serve as a unit on its own. It doesn't really need any outside interference. If there's people living in there, they are taking care of it, then it would basically be this uh, single-celled organism that has like people working in there, like the mitochondria and then are making things happen and the proteins and you, you just create a little cycle where all the water gets reused. So once you capture the rainwater, you filter it and you can drink it, you can cook with it. But then once you use it once, it gets captured to help you flush your toilets, for example, uh, or your shower water gets used again and you can use that as wastewater. And then after it's gone through your toilet, it's called uh, black water, and that you can use to irrigate your gardens. Uh, and then by the time it is filtered through your garden, the water gets put way deep into the soil where it will still be used by the other types of plants that, that you are using. So it's kind of a loop. 
and I would like I would like to I would like to do that and and work on that because I I laid I laid that idea forward in in Peru, uh, but I got discouraged uh, because they said that there's like a lot of earthquakes there, and if you use this concept like completely, then it won't work because like our um, building will. Uh, get partially destroyed or have to repair it and with this work with they use a lot of if they use I mean, their it, yeah I, it completely depends on how you design it there's there's many ways to build with uh keeping in mind that, 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 that there can be earthquakes and so there's there's a lot of things that you could do but if you want to design an earth ship in an area that has shaky ground you want to avoid getting cracks in the building so it might not look like the typical earth ship if i think about a typical earth ship yeah, it's like the yeah. teletubby house that's like half buried in the soil mm. and, and it has like some windows coming and, out and they probably side. have some models there in mexico i know that they have like a school and then they have like certain models and i think those models won't work in peru and, and they have to adapt to the environment and yeah. in peru they use a lot of uh, adobe and uh, so if you're using or you can probably combine these concepts together i would say absolutely uh, yeah, but it's just uh, is a uh, a lot of different uh, ways in which you can build for the, the house for sure, and and also how big your roof is, and you have to adapt that to the environment there as well. So you can only make, and that's why I probably studied this, uh, make a a layout of of a earthship in a in a location where it's uh, built. I would say, so it's not a universal. Uh, design. No, like if I would build an earth ship for, for, for our home country, put it down in Frisia, it would be totally different than one that would be in Mexico because there's totally different, uh, different uh, climates, uh, temperatures, rainfall, uh, daylight hours, and soil types as well. So every, every country would require its own unique approach for building an earth ship. And that only adds to the challenge of making an effective one. Many of these earth ships that are built in New Mexico, each new one builds on the design of the previous one. And so in each time they try this out, they learn more, but they only learn more for that specific area in New Mexico. So we can look at decades of research in earth ships that are built over there, but still that research it can be used to a large degree, but we can't blindly follow it if you're building one in a Dutch climate or maybe high in the Andean mountains. Uh, and if mm -hmm. you only have access to Adobe over there, and there's, for example, no wood around, or wood is really expensive to build with, yeah, you yeah, have they, to come up with a different solution. Yeah, they, they do have trees, but they was planted in the year, year 80, and it's very destructive for the environment there. So would it go against the idea what what the earthship is trying to achieve mm -hmm. uh, but there is one uh, one earthship that i know in in the sacred valley in peru and um, so it, i don't know like uh, i didn't went there but uh, if they build it then then it is possible but they did advise me that, like if you want to build an earthship in peru you should definitely like use a lot of um, techniques that the locals use with adobe and, and other things yeah. as well and there's supposed to be an earthquake there in a few years and so i'm also waiting for that to pass but i'm getting more and more in doubt in, in, in that i really want to do it there uh for now i'm just gonna focus on portugal uh building a wooden cabin uh and maybe in the future i will like expand and then build a, a real uh, earth ship there also but uh, for now it's just a simple wooden cabin is for me sufficient enough and yeah. that's you know, there, there's a there's a lot of different uh, styles and a lot of different. Um, you, different are you interested in like like a like a ski hut kind of cabin? Or yeah, you, yeah, yeah. So, so simple that like would you would you use it like with the round like the tree the tree trunks or would you use planks? Well, that's I'm something I'm gonna discuss with uh, the person that's already uh, having a house there or a cabin, I would say, and yes. he. You know, you have to get inspired by the the location itself and see what the materials are, and then I can make a better planning. Um, yeah, have yeah. Put in... you create a good foundation and maybe yeah, lift it up off the ground if it's going to be wood. You want to have some concrete on the ground that lifts up the wood, otherwise the, the wood's going to rot. 
There's a yeah. lot of techniques and making those really, uh, really self-sufficient has to do with making it very well insulated. So once you finish the outer walls, you really want to make the inside walls very thick and sealed super well so that you never lose any, any t t heat from the inside. Because then you waste so much energy trying to like heat up the inside if it's just coming right through the walls. So wooden cabins are really, really a really good uh, solution with, with very insulated walls and roofs. Then mm. you can then you can also uh, yeah that's that's so that's something that I would keep in mind uh, once you're building it. Make sure that your wall isn't just one layer of wood. Uh, like for me here in the Caribbean, I have one layer of wood because uh, my house is actually open to the outside because I'm in a very hot, humid climate. Uh, so f for me, like I need that open space. Uh, uh, but when you're doing it in uh, Portugal, there might be different conditions and you might want to insulate it very well because you're trying to keep it cool inside. I know Portugal looks a little desert-like in some of the pictures I've seen. So you might live in a very hot climate as well, but yeah. not as you and not as humid. And so then you want to make sure that you don't turn your home into an oven. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's very cold there in the winter as well. So you need isolation for that. Yes, nice. okay. Yeah, uh, exactly. So there's many ways like there's a, like you can go to a hardware store and buy that like a, that, that yellow foam with the aluminum side. And that's like one way of doing it. It's not very environmentally friendly. And so something that's interesting to think about is using something called hempcrete. And you literally take hemp, uh, it is like the non-psychoactive uh, brother of marijuana, and it's compressed. All of this plant material is cut down, chopped up into pieces, and then compressed into these blocks that you can actually use to build homes with. Oh, ah, well. right. Yeah, it, the hemp are uh, legal to grow in, in Portugal. Uh, so, so it yeah, might be possible. You can even you can even turn it into a career and grow hemp as a building material for people to build sustainable homes out of those blocks. Oh it's yeah, something, uh, something very very cool. You can you can do a lot of things with, with hemp. Uh, it's something okay. that ties in with, with actually a lot of things that we're discussing with uh, self sustainability. And the ancients they used a lot of hemp uh, in a lot of, for a lot of different reasons. For, for like uh, rope and and sails and and and, and anything. I think. Like a few years ago, uh, some German car company actually built a car out of hemp, or like the outside is mm. made from hemp. Yeah, I've seen it. Yeah, I've seen it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, if you compress it enough, you can shape it to do anything. Yeah, yeah. Those things are very like powerful in the sense that they can overthrow a lot of uh, things that we're dependent on right now. Uh, and yep. they can also like fuel cars. I've heard, and there's so many different aspects to it. Um, gets into the it, that gets into all the reasons why weed is illegal. There's more than one reason, and, and it doesn't have just have to do with, uh, you know, a lot of people say that if, if that stuff uh, becomes legal, that people would uh, use it to replace a lot of medication, and so it would be a threat to the pharmaceutical industry, because antidepressants wouldn't be as necessary. People could a lot of the times treat their anxiety with this natural remedy. Uh, it's not just that, though. The cotton industry would also be obliterated. But it would literally be gone. Nobody would use cotton anymore because it's very expensive to grow. It's a very labor intensive. And to pick all of that, it would be a much better option economically to grow hemp uh, yeah. and, 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 create, and create fabrics out of those. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're, they're much better for the environment. You can grow multiple, uh, multiple crops every year. Uh, and, and so it would be much more effective. But a lot of the times a better and more effective option isn't the option we're using because somebody is making a lot of money having us do things the hard way. Yeah, yeah. But something that I mentioned in a previous episode, like we are getting into and I, this age, it's almost not deniable anymore that we, we, we're facing so much problems with like the climate change and uh, people are not satisfied with institutions. So we have to provide and also the corruption with all with and the wars so we have to transition into something else and i think hemp is a very big solution uh and, and weed is also a very big solution but that's also um, misused by a lot of people as well but that's an entire different subject uh, <laughs> it gets a bad rap right yeah it gets a bad rap but it has a lot of good good aspects um uh, to you know, what, what else can you, like, for example, you need gas. Gas is something with self-sufficient house, which is 
you know, yeah, if you, like wanna, if you wanna, if you wanna, gas. is that or you burn wood? So gas is better because uh, uh, you know we can get gas like in the Netherlands. There's natural gas. Yeah, and, uh, we're, we're able to like this gas. But they have to drill deeper and deeper for that. So that's uh, they have to drill deeper and deeper, and they have parking. to go sideways, and they have to do all kinds of things now to get to that gas. Yeah. So for now, you know, it's 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 still a little better than oil, but we would be much better off using electricity because we can we get electricity for free if we if we're allowed to use that technology. Yeah, but the electricity uh, wood stuff or the stoves. Yeah, electric, electric stoves were way better. Like I lived in a few homes where I didn't have a gas burner, but my stove was electric. And when you work with an electric stove, your water boils much quicker. Everything goes much faster. Because it doesn't take a lot of energy. No, it's more efficient. It takes less energy. Hmm. And because electricity is renewable and gas isn't, it's also a better. But you have to get an integrated one, I would say, because if you get like one that's uh that you can buy you know and have like an extra uh, cable then like we had it here we turned one of those electric uh gases on and you didn't know so it was an accident uh but it this is an old house so it took a lot of electricity so lights went off and we were like oh what is happening here uh, uh but yeah. but and then eventually uh this there was glass on that uh, standing on that uh, stove and they and the glass eventually exploded a little bit no one got hurt but uh it was uh for us like okay takes a lot of you know, electricity we're not gonna use it entirely so and that's more the old old um or maybe an older type or whatever but i think it with these new, new houses and what you're referring to where they have this i've seen it that you can like put your hand on it and uh, you cannot burn it, and then it turns red. You can see uh, that you that it's now heated. Yeah, right? exactly. Mine would turn red with lights to help, but kind of show like as if it was fire, uh, so that people would know red or stay away. Yeah, um, yeah. But uh, but there there's different solutions to this, and there's actually a an interesting group of new construction or new homes that were built in uh, my hometown, Snake, where um, they were. They were generating electricity in the homes from their own bio waste. So when people would use the bathroom and they would do the number two and they would flush that, that, that was actually kept in a tank underneath the home. And because it sits there, the gas that is released from all of this can be used to uh, generate electricity. And part of the power that's used by these family homes comes from these waste tanks. Uh, and so there are definitely ways to use electricity uh, without uh, bringing your power bill up too much. And mm -hmm. an older design of an electric stove might take a lot of energy, especially if it's used in a very old building. Like you're saying, the farmhouse is from 1800. I would not be surprised if the electrical wiring that's in that home is from the 70s or the 80s. That, uh, yeah, that yeah. wouldn't be unlikely to me. Yeah, probably. I don't know for sure, but it, it could be, yeah. Uh, I think we are getting into like two hours of uh, recording and uh, I think uh, we had a very good episode and I want to announce something to the viewers that you would be interested in to co-hosting so we'll definitely see you some, some more often in, in, in the coming episodes i don't know we'll have to see with planning and stuff and i don't know absolutely yeah i would love to i'd love to uh be, to take part in these conversations because it, yeah. it's really important uh you know we're, we're, we're talking about things that uh, might be worth for other people listening into yeah 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 because uh right now i'm a little bit tired and so i'm a little bit more in that background and I'm trying my best to really um talk and, and speak about all these things that are some are very with you with the architecture very complicated because uh i've ne never uh, done a lot of research on that and it's all very new uh, but uh yeah i think that's uh it's a very fascinating uh, conversation that we had and uh it's just uh yeah we'll definitely keep in touch about uh, how we will do this um but uh yeah and also i want to thank you for your time and uh for this podcast and uh 
Is there something else you want to mention? Uh, some, some project that you're in or uh, uh, something that, that you want to bring out of the people that is important to know? Uh, if I would, uh, if I would leave one message with uh, with your viewers, it would be to uh, to take this take this uh, time to focus inwards, not be afraid of what's going on around you. Focus uh, focus on your own goals, and uh, don't 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 lose hope. And mm. uh, if you want to look me up online, uh, I'm at the dot monakiros on Instagram. You can find me there, and uh, I'll keep you posted on uh, whatever project I'm working on. Awesome. And I said awesome. right now I do my own uh, my own little uh, online business, helping people market their products on social media, because uh, that's a big part of the world we're living in nowadays. Got to go along with the times. Mm. And uh, I'll soon be posting some of my architecture stuff as well. So keep an eye out. Nice, nice. Okay. Uh, I will put that in the in the description, uh, the link, and. Uh, to the viewers, thank you for watching. Uh, be sure to like and subscribe. Um, uh, yeah, just uh, be blessed. And I really love the, the ending words you had there. Nothing namaste. Very to, yeah, namaste. I don't have a lot of things to add to that. So uh, goodbye, everyone, and uh, see you later.